Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I'm, I'm nervous, but uh, okay. So let me see. I'm gonna. All right. Um, yeah, you know, when I. I haven't been here 20 total years. It was like, there was like a two year gap that I wasn't here. And I lose track of how long I've been here this time around. But um, I remember coming to a meeting and all the adjuncts in, uh, in the clothing and foods, we were all meeting, well, for family and consumer sciences. So there were um, foods, clothing, and interior design. And a couple of women introduced themselves and said that, um, they had been teaching adjunct for like 14 years and I thought, oh my gosh, 14 years. And here I am, like 17 years or something like that. Um, I love it, I do, I love it. So I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I have, so this is me and my husband and our kids. Um, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. I have five sisters and one brother. The brother is in that one picture. He's the baby. Um, so the poor guy has uh, six older sisters. And I hadn't thought about it, but how about his poor wife? Can you imagine marrying into a family of six sisters-in-law? But she's awesome. Um, so I grew up in the Bay Area. I came to BYU um, as a home economics major, and I stayed a home economics major. I didn't change course. And um, after my undergraduate, I went on a mission to Bolivia. Anybody go to Bolivia on a mission? Your wife? Oh, she's probably younger than I am. What mission did she go to? Santa Cruz. Oh, she went to the good part. See, okay, when I was there, there were two missions, La Paz and Cochabamba. I did serve, I served in Cochabamba. I did serve in Santa Cruz, and I always said, oh, once they created that mission, I was like, that's the place to go because it's more jungle, the people are really more laid back, really friendly, lovely. They get a little more closed off and a little different type personalities as you get further west. Now you know that about Bolivia. Um, then after my mission, I got the opportunity to come back here and work on a master's in family sciences with an emphasis in cross-cultural studies. So my um, thesis was on the meaning of home for an immigrant Bolivian family. And I spent a lot of time with a Bolivian family um, kind of documenting and seeing what their life looked like and, and how they perceived home life in the US versus back home in, um, in Bolivia. And so this cute little right here is um, me and my daughters and I'm with Dr. Brazier. Um, Dr. Ruth Brazier was the director of the home economics, well, it was a department, so she was the chair of the home economics department back when I was a student, and I still see her occasionally, like at the Provo Temple and, um, and at events that she comes to, and after I graduated, uh, and, you know, kind of, so I had my undergrad, in, my undergrad in home economics education, so I student taught, all that stuff, then, um, I got my master's and then as I was like living my adult life doing different jobs and especially in the church I realized I was like I got in teaching callings and I was you know in classes where we would use that teaching no greater call manual and I thought Dr. Brazier and Dr. Ellsworth and Dr. Coombs all these people who taught me how to teach could have written these manuals or maybe they did or maybe they took the manuals and decided to use it in the home ec ed program but whatever the case was i feel really fortunate because i learned to teach from some really gifted educators um i so hey mel can you forward my my daughter's here and now i'm really glad she came because i'm just gonna have her um move my slides as i need them um so I teach over 100 students per semester in a lecture room in B037. And they come to lecture. I just finished my lecture um, just now. And we talked about eggs. And then they're going to come to lab in um, five different groups of like 20 students. And we'll cook. And they'll be making stuff with eggs. So I get to have them in a big group of 100, but then I get to get them in a small group of 20. So I'm not an expert, like 
I'm not an expert, but I, there are some things I like to do to, um, to help kind of get to know my students, whether it's in the big room or even in the small room. And obviously in the small room, there are things that are more conducive. These are just some fun things we've done. Um, the top picture, um, one of our TAs designed this t-shirt. If you can see, it says, I'm only here for the free food. And we'll pick a day where we all wear that t-shirt and the kids, the students get a kick out of it. This bottom one, um, it, I'm wearing the birthday apron. So years ago, we made a birthday apron and if we find out it's a student's birthday, we, let, we have them wear the apron. And um, that was my birthday and we decided to all represent our favorite college, those of us down that worked in the foods lab. So I have um, a daughter that went to University of Arkansas. I have this daughter served a mission in Arkansas and served on campus. And my son currently lives in Arkansas where his wife is going to University of Arkansas. So that's why I'm representing Arkansas and my daughter and son have, he's got his pig nose on and um, Starlin's daughter was just returned from her mission to Florida. So she had that, so it was just fun. And I learned some of this stuff actually from a podcast that I, I listened to a podcast by um, the guy who started Shake Shack. And he talked about the culture. And the culture of his business is all about, honestly, the employees. He focuses on the employees and building a tight group with the employees. And I love how that, we get to have it. These are TAs. And, and um, Natalie, our director, and Starlin, our lab manager, and a couple of students that are thrown in there, but they're like my neighbor and my nephew. You know, so they're family. They've grown up knowing Foods Lab. Um, but when you, if you have the opportunity with TAs or coworkers to create that environment, then it spills out into the lab too, into the students. They kind of, you know, there's just this part of, you know, kind of family. Okay, go ahead, Mel, please. Um, um, and so if you go to Teaching No Greater Call, which is still available, you can find that online. Now we use um, Teaching in the Savior's Way. But if you, if you were to go to Teaching No Greater Call, you'd see topics like love those you teach, reach out to those who do not attend, um, take advantage of spontaneous learning moments, make a plan, use music, stories, and art to teach. So there are all sorts of ideas. And again, I learned these as an undergrad and then through like going to classes and learning how to teach in Sunday school. Um, one thing I do when I notice that a student, if I'll go through my grade book and I'm inputting grades, if I see that a student doesn't have a couple of grades in a row, I'll put their name on a post-it and I stick it in my pocket. I like to wear clothes with pockets to work because I live and die by my post-it notes <laughs> that are in my pocket. So I'll put their name on a post-it note and then I'll, I'll find them in lab and I'll, you know, I'll talk to them. Or if they're not in lab, I'll shoot them an email. Um, so that kind of helps me find out, you know, we missed you. Um, other things, students will let me know. Sometimes I don't notice, but students will say, hey, our lab person hasn't been here for two weeks. Can you find out what's up? Oh, sure. So I really appreciate their help with that. Um, I've, um, in, in lab, I'll walk around, and probably the most common thing that happens is just being able to correct them on technique. Like they'll be using a paring knife to chop an onion. I'll go, oh, let me show you an easier way to do that. And so I get time to just kind of, you know, help them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but no matter what our training, we have a lot of resources. And the Savior was the perfect example. John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way. The master teacher, right? And he taught to the one, and he taught to multitudes. And even when he was teaching the multitudes, he had a way to reach the one. Um, I could also go <laughs> on about um, President Nelson. I mean, Elder Gong had some remarks recently about traveling with President Nelson to the um, Pacific Islands and how he noticed President Nelson was able to connect with the one while reaching out to a group. So I have a couple of thoughts on that. Okay, go ahead forward. Um, that's Kindergarten Dana. Um, there's a real great story behind this. I remember, so I was barely five. Um, we were lined up to get our school pictures taken that day, and my teacher <coughs> noticed that that cute little clip that was in my hair was crooked, and my teacher fixed it for me. Okay, if you will click, that's the teacher. 
It even, see, I even have in my kindergarten writing, that was Mr. K. Mr. Um, Mr. Kimball, he fixed my little clip when he noticed that it was crooked and I was going to get my little kindergarten picture taken. I was five. I'm 53, so that was a long time ago. But I still remember it. So um, I, I'm hoping, okay, we're going to share. So I'm hoping some of you, while we've been talking, because I want a couple of people to share, Who's a teacher that had an impact on you? I talked about some of my professors that taught me how to teach. They modeled it, they taught us, they grilled it, um, they coached us, and then cute Mr. Kimball, you know, fixing my clip. So a couple of you share. Who's a teacher that you think about that had an impact on you? I'm guessing somebody's a teacher because of a teacher. Yeah, <laughs> Dean Ogles. I was in sociology class as an accounting teacher. <coughs> and the social professor, this is by you, I don't even know who it was. And he grabbed me after class and asked me if I'd ever thought of going to graduate school. And I'd never thought of going to graduate school the first time I met him. Wow. I probably wouldn't have gone to graduate school if he hadn't stopped me. Oh my gosh. Okay, thank you. Okay, you had your hand up, Jeff? Um, I remember my second Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was uh, very fascinated with it was called the Exton Team, it was an experimental plane. Oh. And she got me everything about that and kept getting more and more advanced. By the end of the second grade, I was reading her sixth grade novel because she took the time to match the reading to what my interest. It was really a little one. Wow. Wow. Anybody else want to share? Yes, Karen. Yeah, thank you for sharing. So somebody who encouraged you to think about graduate school, somebody who found books when you were in second grade that matched what you were passionate about, and then a teacher who gave you a part and then complimented you in front of others and let you know that you were doing a great job at your part. Thank you so much. Go ahead and click, Mel, thanks. Um, so I've just interspersed some pictures because I thought it would be more fun to look at pictures than to just hear me talk. And, and we're also, like I said, I want to share too. But um, at our um, university conference just this August, um, President Worthen talked about um, the, well, each of our students is a beloved spirit son or daughter of heavenly parents. And he encouraged us to find a way to help them see their potential and to reach, um, you know, what they can do. And I really appreciated that. Um, it's, it's hard, but I do, here's the thing. If we listen to the spirit, I'm kind of a spoiler alert. If we listen to the spirit, we will know how we can reach out to students. I know that for sure, okay, because I've had it happen. So this is just, uh, these are, um, our student teachers from last winter who are now first year teachers teaching foods or clothing and loving it one of them says i keep waiting for the day when i'm supposed to like come home crying but i don't it's just like it's so awesome i love it and then this cute um at my favorite lab of the whole semester is when my students make a pie i don't get to eat their pie but they each make a pie they take it home bake it and eat it and they are so proud of their pies and um, this is one of my students with his pie. And he's like, come in here, get in this picture. I'm on his mutual profile. That picture <laughs> is on his mutual profile. Um, so, you know. He was also in the magazine that BYU puts out with dating ideas. He was on the cover of, like, the last couple month one, like, in a canoe with some girl. So he's working it. He's trying to figure, you know, he's getting, he's working on it. So President Worthen's idea for us to help our students 
you know, we can increase the value of their education by helping them see their value. We can't really do that without seeing the one and reaching out to the ones. Go ahead. Um, again, this is just another fun times in the foods lab. Um, I met Jay that owns J Dogs one day just when I went in there and I started talking to him. I told him how much I loved his place and I loved the vibe. And, and um, he was kind enough. He's come in a couple of times to speak to my students about his business. And one time when he found out it was a small enough class, he said, I'm going to bring stuff for hot dogs. So um, we all got to, he told us about his business and we all got to learn how to score the hot dogs and swore to secrecy that we wouldn't tell. And then we got to have the sauce and all the fixins. OK, go ahead. And these are just a couple of other things. Um, this one on the left, I had a student. This is just in talking with students, you know found out that her um, Bachelor of Fine Arts exhibit was going to be in the MOA. And she was super excited about it. And I thought, you know what, I'm on campus. It takes me 10 minutes to walk to the MOA to see her exhibit. And I've done that a couple of times. I just happened to keep in touch with this student, so I was able to like snag a picture from her Instagram. But I've done that a couple of times. Um, you know, when students talk about something that's important to them, it, it's not hard to just kind of try and find time. Um, um, just the, you see the TA interacting with the student. Now, this student happens to be a family friend, and that's my other daughter. So, you know, it's kind of like they grew up together. But also just <laughs> coaching them and helping them. And um, our TAs are so good at that. They're so kind to the students. And then this picture on the right, our students all prepare, they plan and prepare a magnificent meal. It's one of the last labs. It's something they have planned. And I genuinely um, compliment them if they've done something that's really cool. And these carrots, look at how beautiful that is. Like, I had to take a picture. And then I went home and made them that week. And then I went back and told them I made those carrots for company. And like, I asked them for the recipe. And I joke, you know, when you see the Great British Baking Show, if you get like the Paul Hollywood handshake, I'm like, listen. If I'm asking for your recipe, that's like the Paul Hollywood handshake. And, they, you know, they'd laugh. Um, but um, these are beautiful. So I just had to include that. Um, kind of like Karen, you were saying, you know, when you get a compliment, somebody noticed you. OK, go ahead, Mel. Thank you. So, so that's a long way to get to the topic. Um, OK, I want you to be thinking, though, because so I've thrown out some things that I do. So if you teach a class of over 100 students, raise your hand. OK. What kind of things have you done to try and reach students? Can a couple of you share? Yeah. I worked on, on the course role and what you Yeah. Actually, <laughs> OK, that Polynesian kid that was in that last one, like he grew up with my kids. When he took my class, it was a total setup. I was like, you, volunteer to say the prayer, and I'm going to call you by name. Then they're all going to think I learned everybody's names already. Um, another thing that I do, because I'm horrible with names. I don't, know, I don't know most of their names. So lest you think I'm like this, this is true confession. I'm not a great teacher in a lot of ways. I love it, but there are things I could improve on. Um, if somebody comes to talk to me, I do ask them, remind me your last name? <laughs> then I haven't asked them what their name is. I've just asked what their last name is, and then I can figure out <laughs> who they are. Um, so there's another one. Um, how about somebody else with a large class? What do you do? That's a great tip. Natalie, you had an idea that you shared with me when we were talking. Or say pass, and we'll go on from there. And if you're uncomfortable with 
are you called on to come up to me after class and let me know? And then they just make a note of it. And it works really well for them. And I'm thinking about it in a university setting. But after the fact, you can then just shoot them a quick email saying thank you so much for your comments in class. But you can almost, this is like a cheater way of doing it. But almost have like a draft email that's and then just add a little bit to it to make it more personal because they never know that you're sending a similar email to everybody else as you're doing it. And then most, from what I gathered, most of the larger classes have TAs in them. So if a student raises their hand, remind me what your last name is, the TA can jot down the last name. You can look on the roll for the first name then and still shoot them an email after class. And one thing that I found has been fabulous for me for my classes that are like 50 plus even. I don't know how many of you have the BYU like app. On it has the class roles and has flashcards <laughs> with it and if you've ever used them before. <laughs> and I found that that's just like a, I remember it for actually from my freshman year, my fifth up and put us all on flashcards. And that's how we learned all of our names within like three weeks. Okay. And so it was something that I, you, uh, you had mentioned also, you could email a couple of students before lecture and just say, I'd like you to think about this. Would you be willing to share this? You know, and then you send them that follow-up. Thank you. So just some different ways that you can include an individual student even in a big setting. Anybody else want to share what you've done in a large class to try and find the one? Yeah. I've, I've found myself often wondering <coughs> how the brethren when they come and give a devotional mm -hmm. at BYU are able to reach the one, they consistently express their love for everyone that's mm -hmm. there. And I wondered how individuals are able to feel that. And I once heard one remark that they would pick out about 15 people in the audience and instead of scanning ah. visually back and forth, which just turns it all into a, a big fog, they would make eye contact persistently with those individuals and you could feel their connection mm -hmm. with those individuals mm -hmm. and then generalize it to well he cares about me as well that's really good that's awesome thank you how about those of you who have classes that are smaller like maybe 30 to 50 what do you do to find or to know what the one might need donna Yes, you do. That's right. I think her name should have been. I have to work on that. <laughs> so then it, it almost becomes a little bit of a joke where I think I kind of start calling you that. And I'm like, oh, it's this. And so we'll talk about that. And so I try and find out something about that student mm -hmm. that's memorable or unique, where they're from, or something that ties me, maybe a common link or something to that student besides the name thing. And then, um, and then I find that much easier. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mel, will you go to the next slide? So I used to, on our midterm, we used to have two open-ended questions that were, uh, what have you learned so far and what would you still like to learn? And I would read those and I would make notes. Oh, so-and-so in Friday Lab wants to learn how to make pretzels. Okay, when we're making pretzels, I'm, and it, I post it in my pocket, when we're making pretzels, I'm going to pull this person over if he's not in that kitchen and say, come help these guys make the pretzels. I remember you said you wanted to learn how to make pretzels. Um, and so I'd read through, you know, like a hundred of them, but I would jot down things that I might be able to facilitate. One time I had a student say, I want to learn how to poach an egg. I too had never poached an egg, and that was one of the things on my list of things to learn. So during the egg lab, I said, hey, you and I both want to learn to poach an egg. Let's go watch a YouTube video and let's do it. We poached it. We tasted it. We're like, oh, not that good. Okay, we're good. Um, but, you know, if you, <laughs> I didn't love it. I think I'd probably like it with an English muffin and ham and sauce on it. But just a poached egg, it wasn't my favorite. This semester, I, I had an impression that I followed. And I handed out little, these are the actual pieces of paper. I handed out slips of paper to each student in lecture. And I said, I want you to write on one side something you're excited about learning. And I want you to write on the other side a concern that you have. Because I don't have that on my midterm anymore. And I said, it doesn't even have to be, but I didn't have concerns on the midterm. It was just um, an impression I had. I'll be honest, it was an impression. 
So one side, they wrote something they're excited to learn. The other side, a concern they have. I said, it doesn't have to do with this class. It can be a life concern. So just, and then I get all these papers. Natalie looked at me, she's like, Dana, have fun <laughs> sorting through all that, because there's all these papers. So go ahead and, um, so those are them in a jar. But these are, this is what came up, and I actually shared with my students today. I showed them the picture of the jar. I did not show them this list, but I showed them the picture of the jar, and I said, if you think you're alone with your concern, know that you're not, because all of the concerns had overlaps. So these, in general, were their concerns. Okay, so, and very few of them have to do with the class I teach, which is cooking. Okay, now, I can cover lack of time and money to cook, and I do talk about that, and I'll probably touch on it even more, um, that I know there were a handful of students who said that. Um, I, um, I can also, uh, I, li I like to budget, so I can probably hit on money, that would be time and money. Um, the rest of them are quite, you know, heavy or out of my, you know, expertise. Um, that's where, that's where um, the idea of ministering comes in. I kind of think of helping find our students and what their concerns are and helping teach them is bringing ministering to our work at BYU. Um, we're learning of others' needs and we're doing it, we're doing the Lord's work. A thing that also helps reach individual students is um, to use a variety of teaching methods, not just the same thing all the time. You know, back I talked about, pull out, find Teaching No Greater Call, find that old book, look at all the methods it talks about, music, um, stories. Um, I have, and besides asking, you know, like this was a specific ask, and I will repeat this, I really liked this, um, but I also, I have had, assignments help me learn about students and I've also noticed body language. I had a, I have a student in one um, class, I have one class that I lecture to a small group of 21 and then they go immediately into lab. So I see all 21 of them but one of them kind of sits behind a pillar that's in my room and when I do see that student it's kind of like I can't make out what the student's thinking so I was like mm -hmm. so I made a point to go hang out in that kitchen more while they were cooking just to and, and nothing came of it, but I made a point to take a little more time over that direction because I had kind of a blank stare from that direction. Um, if you'll scroll on to the next one, Mel. So Michelle Craig in October conference said, you can pray and ask the Lord for an errand. As you do, he can use your ordinary skills to accomplish his extraordinary work. Donna and I have a similar ordinary skill I'm finding, and that is finding weird things to connect with students about. I still remember that I had a student who, I walk around and I ask my students, tell me something interesting about you when I have them in that group of 20. I remember one of them has a Grammy. Like, yeah, a Grammy? He was in a boys choir that participated in an album that won a Grammy. So he has a Grammy. Um, so th that's one of my or ordinary skills. I li I'm nosy, I like to find out about people. This girl, I was guest lecturing in a class and I introduced myself like I did today. I said, I'm from, I grew up in the Bay Area. Anybody grew up in the Bay Area? She raised her hand. I said, I went on to my mission to Bolivia. Anybody go on a mission to Bolivia? She raised her hand. I said, where did you grow up? Same town, went to Bolivia on her mission. I'm like, we're twins. So we got a picture. Um, Anyway, um, what's your ordinary skill? Who has an ordinary skill that you think you can use? Everybody has an ordinary skill, but what's yours? Yes? I can poke an egg. Hey, <laughs> nice. And actually, if you go back one slide. Yeah, go back one, Mel. By a poached egg? <laughs> <laughs> You can poached egg, true, they're cheap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who else has an ordinary talent? An or just an ordinary skill. Come on, two people share. What's a skill you have that you can use to connect with people? Yes? Uh, I 
play chess in my office and I just want to see them. <gasps> oh, that's fantastic. When the few of them that do dare do that come in. Yes, <laughs> good. But so I offer the extension, uh, the invitation at the beginning of each semester. You know, I, I reached out to, before this presented, when I had this, so we got to pick the topic. I mulled over topics. When I picked this one, I reached out to Jim Brow, who teaches finance. He's my son's father-in-law, so we will someday co-grandparent. And he teaches lectures of 800 students. And I said, Jim, how do you do it? One thing he told me that he did, he, he loves to work out. He has his VASA pass, and he has privileges to bring two guests. He said for like two years, he'd have students sign up to come work out with him. He said it got just so cumbersome, though, that he couldn't do it anymore. But um, he would have students work out with him. That was one thing. I mean, I was like, wow, good for you, Jim. Um, so who else? has So chess, yes. Okay. So I need a lot of personal stories. Good. Sometimes they relate to uh -huh. what I'm talking about. Sometimes they don't. Yeah. But I find them interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I'll tell my stories. Um, go on. So this is also Sister Craig in her talk. And I, I really recommend this. I knew my topic going into conference. And this talk really resonated with me. I made note of it. I've listened to it a number of times. When you receive promptings and then act with intention, the Lord can use you. The more you act, the more familiar the voice of the Spirit becomes. While you finish reading that quote, I'll tell you why I have a picture of M&Ms. Because um, I know y'all can read. Um, uh, my, one of our assignments our students do is they write a two-page paper on food. Anything that has to do with food. It can be a favorite food, it can be international food, it can be, I've had students write a movie review of Ratatouille, it can be anything. One time I was, uh, so I know for some people maybe you can't all do this, but I like to grade that assignment. I don't like to have my TAs grade it because I learn about my students. So I'm reading through and I read a paper by a young lady who said that um, she never liked M&Ms but they were her mom's favorite candy. And her mom passed away recently, and now she likes to eat M&Ms because it reminds her of her mom. I had a very distinct impression, and I wrote it down, not on a post-it, I put it on my grocery list, to buy a bag of caramel M&Ms. Because if you haven't tried them, they're the best ones. They just came out with them like in the last two years. I don't know why it took so long. But I bought a bag, and I made sure and looked at the picture roll so I would recognize her. And I had them in my bag, and you know, it wasn't even, it didn't even take till I saw her in lab. I was walking down the hall the next day, and I saw her studying, just sitting on the floor of the basement of the JFSB. And I said, oh, I have something for you. And I just told her, I said, I read your paper, that was so sweet, and have you tried the caramel M&Ms? And she's like, no. So um, I gave them to her, and I just said, you know, I just thought you might enjoy these. And um, I've never heard from her since, and that's okay, you know. Um, but I had the impression, and I followed it. And that's what um, Sister Craig talks about, is take time to receive the impressions, listen, you know, seek them, listen to them, follow them, you know, act, act on it. Okay. And um, so <laughs> these are, I actually came to campus yesterday to just see, is that picture so big that it's going to scare everybody? <laughs> um, these are the tips that I got from Jim Brow, because I know that man connects with his students, 800 at a time, and I know he connects with them. He told me, he said, I, um, I don't know their names, I don't know them personally, but I have many students come to me and say, your class made a difference in my life. So I said, what do you do, Jim? And he said, be vulnerable, be enthusiastic, be genuine, and um, this is me. I thought about wearing it today, but my friend said, um, are they going to be recording it? And I said, yes. <laughs> and she said, probably don't wear the um, sweatshirt then, because somebody watching it later might not get it in context, and that would be weird. Um, so be yourself. I added be yourself. He said vulnerable, enthusiastic, genuine. I added be yourself. I'm not Jeff Hill. I'm not Alan Hawkins. I'm not Aaron Holmes. I'm not Carolyn Chipman. I tell you though, what I love about Aaron, we went, when, when I was hired to come back the second time, we went down the hallway in the ASB to get our pictures taken at the same time. And she was so nice, we were both new. Every time I see her, she's like, hi Dana, how are you? And she makes me feel so important. 
Um, but be yourself. If it's a goofy Halloween sweatshirt, wear it. Um, if it's playing chess with your students, do it. Um, if you'll go on to the next one, this next one is what Jim shared with me. This is in um, Dr. Brow's syllabus for his finance class. I said, can I share that? He said, yeah. I said, do you want me to edit it or not give your name? And he said, no, I don't care because 1,600 students see it every year. Um, but this tells so much about him. I know because either his son told me, I, no, either his daughter, who's my daughter-in-law, either his daughter told me or he told me or my son who took his class. I don't remember. That's not how they met, though. Um, my son and his wife met at a bachelor party. She was best friends with the groom, and he was best friends with the bride, and they met, and now they're happily married. But anyway, I know for a fact that Jim, this is what he tells his students. He says, if you have questions about the class, please go to my TAs. If you have questions about life, I want you to come to me, and I want to help you. And I love that he says this invitation extends beyond the length of our class and beyond membership in the LDS church. Um, so that says a lot about Jim. Um, OK, go on to the next one. So I will close oh, with my number one tip, you guys. This is my number one tip, um, spiritual thoughts. Um, this is how I cover everything else on that list that we saw a few slides back that have nothing to do with food or interior design or clothing or family relations that I studied. I rely on spiritual thoughts. Years ago, I saw a devotional given by a, um, I've tried to find it, but couldn't find it because all I remembered was the professor was a convert, an accounting professor, and he talked about the importance of spiritual thought in the classroom. He said, our students can learn anything, all of these topics anywhere, but at BYU, we have the unique opportunity to bring the spirit and to share spiritual thoughts. And he challenged faculty to include spiritual thoughts in every class. I have done that since then. These are some of the topics that I've covered. Um, but it's, it's different every time. It's, Karen knows, I walked into lab this morning and I said, I'm thinking I want to share with them they're not alone. Can anybody think of a scripture? And Karen said, um, now what was it? Uh, he shall not be named. Yes, yeah. And so we looked it up and I was able to share, you're not alone and also share a scripture. I have some quotes tucked in my um, binder that I use in a pinch if I can't, you know, if nothing really comes to me. Um, if you'll go on to the next slide. The quote that I first started, I laminated it, and I always have this one. This is um, President Hinckley. But I have used different topics throughout the semester for the strength of youth. I have encouraged active of service and had them tell us about it. We share. The children's Bible videos, if you have not watched those, those are a gem, and they are so great. So I ask a student to give a prayer before we start lecture, and then I share a spiritual thought. Just last week, driving into work, my daughter played the music, and the, a song really touched me. And so I came in, and I felt impressed to play that song. And I know my students are under a lot of stress, anxiety, worries. So I said, I want you to get comfortable in your chair. I want you to just close your eyes. I'm going to play a song. And we just melted into our chairs, let the stress go, listen to this song that's just a lovely song um, called A Rainbow, no, A Rainbow Over Your Head? I think it's just called Rainbow. Rainbows. Um, and, and a student actually on Wednesday in lab came up to me and said, thank you so much for playing that song. I really needed to hear that. Now, when I was um, talking with Jim, my future co-grandparent, about this topic and going back and forth. What does vulnerable look like? Do you pray about your work? Do you do a spiritual thought? He said, um, I always do a spiritual thought, and this is how I do it. And he sent me a YouTube link. He was the one who gave that devotional. March 1st, 2011, Jim Brow. I said, I'm sorry, I thought you were accounting, your finance. Um, so it was Jim who gave that devotional, March 1st, 2011. So this is my testimony to you. I have looked for that devotional, could not find it. I didn't know where to look. I get it from Jim. I said, Jim, we've been connected since 2011. I highly recommend that devotional. If you're not incorporating spiritual thoughts, 
I think it's the thing that has helped me connect most with my students. Um, and I know that Heavenly Father knows the one because I reached out to Jim, he answered my question, I asked more questions, and he sent me the devotional I've been looking for for eight and a half years. Um, so I know if we'll go ahead and, please, thanks. I know if we'll just put our minds to it and pray about it, um, I know we can be God's hands. We can see the one, we can find what they need, and, and, and as an end result, we'll be teaching to the one. I just know it happens because it happened in me preparing for this, and I'm so thankful for that. And um, I leave this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.